Hello and welcome to everyone who's joining us for this interview, which is part of Cambridge Judge Business School video series, CJBS Perspectives, Leadership in Unprecedented Times. I'm Sandra Dawson. Now I'm a fellow and advisory board member of Cambridge Judge Business School, but perhaps better known to many of you who are viewing this conversation as one of the first directors of the school, and so far the only woman to hold that role. It was my enormous pleasure and privilege to lead the school from 1995 to 2006, when we began to grow into the great business school we are today. And today we are truly honored to be in the presence of Robin L. Washington, who's just stepped down a year or so ago as executive vice president and chief financial officer of the listed bio company, Gilead Sciences, and she's pivoted from a career as a top executive leader in her, to, into her current situation, where she's a main board director of several companies with household names, Salesforce, Honeywell, and Alphabet, the parent company of Google, as well as serving on boards of charities and public bodies, including the UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital Oakland Board of Directors, and the Financial Accounting Foundation. Welcome, Robin. Welcome. It's fantastic to e-meet you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me in conversation. On behalf of Cambridge Judge Business School, we're absolutely thrilled that you're so graciously enriching the series of conversations with global leaders. As a starter to our conversation, I'd like to ask you to tell me a little bit about yourself, your background, and the trajectory of your remarkable career so far. Well, thank you very much, Sandra, for that wonderful introduction and uh, a special thank you. It's an honor and a privilege um, to be able to participate um, in this event with the University of Cambridge, in particular, the business school. And Sandra, I was really happy to hear about your role that you've played in really raising the visibility of the business school. So I, I think that's wonderful. I had the opportunity to live in the Netherlands for a few years and spent a lot of time in Cambridge and in London and other parts of the UK. So I'm very happy to participate in this event. Um, so, um, as you mentioned, um, it's always interesting when someone reads your bio, right? Because I view myself very differently. And I, I've been on this journey um, for several years and unbeknownst to what I started when I went off to college, I started off wanting to be a Supreme Court justice. I ultimately <laughs> became a, a, a lawyer first and then eventually a judge and a, a Supreme Court justice, but um, ultimately you know, veered my way in my journey into the financial area. And um, it's, it's been such a joy to business partner and be involved in, in so many different great companies with great cultures. Um, more importantly, companies with great missions. So as I mentioned, I started off university in the Midwest. I'm from the Midwest. Um, I, um, my parents sent me to an all girls boarding school um, for high school. And I think it was one of those um, really interesting events because um, it was probably my first introduction to really the globalness of the world. I had a roommate from Honduras, Central America, and I was there in the late seventies and we had several girls join us from um, Iran during the Iran Contra crisis. And I, again, as I said, it was probably my first introduction to the politics and the circumstances of others in very different situations um, than I was, I was growing up in the United States in the Midwest. I went on to University of Michigan, again, started as a, a English literature major. And um, I, I tell my kids this, they don't always listen. Is I listened to my dad who told me, you know, you really should, it's, it's great to be, want to be a lawyer, but you really should think about getting some grounding in business and understanding account, accounting. So he had me work with his CPA. He had a, a small real estate business and, uh, encouraged me to go to business school for accounting with a caveat that eventually he would help me go to law school if, if that ever happened. 
So I became a CPA and um, again, early in my journey, I can say probably through most of my twenties, I spent a lot of time learning what I didn't like to do or what didn't really fit for me. I worked in the Federal Reserve Bank. I was an auditor. I even started a master's in taxation and um, just really didn't enjoy it. And what I did enjoy was really the opportunity to really learn what the organizations that I was auditing did. And I took a role as a regional controller for a service organization of Tandem Computers, which was based in Silicon Valley. And I had the opportunity to come out once a quarter to Silicon Valley and loved it being from Michigan. Um, but more importantly, I had the opportunity in that role to really spin in operations, you know, back then they were the big raised um, uh, computer center. So I had the opportunity to really go around with the engineers and learn more about what fault tolerant computing, computing was. And I think what differentiated that role for me was realizing that I really liked being part of operations. I liked business partnering with an operational leader and I saw finance is more than just numbers and auditing and more as a way to tell a story about the business and what was happening with the tr prior trends, but more importantly, what could we predict going forward from that? So ultimately I ended up moving to Silicon Valley with that role. And um, through that journey, um, I ultimately ended up getting my um, executive MBA as part of that organization, which gave me um, some visibility at the more senior leaderships because I had a thesis paper that I had to put together. So I got to work on it with uh, the CEO and um, it, it really elevated my visibility in the organization and more importantly, got me to really work on what some opportunities or critical problems that we were working on as a company. Um, after nine years at that role, um, I ultimately joined PeopleSoft, which was another company that was moving into um, enterprise software. And I really enjoyed um, my role there because customers were using products that I used, and that was financial software um, and some HR software. And I started that role. Initially, they wanted me to bring me in to do something that I was very familiar with. Um, and that was revenue accounting. And when I was interviewing with the CFO, um, they asked, they told me about a role that was based in Europe. And it just piqued my interest. I had just finished my MBA and my husband had finished his. And um, so one of the things that we always enjoyed and had thought about doing was living abroad. So about three months later, I ended up in Munich, Germany, helping to set up our European operations at PeopleSoft Computer. And uh, at, I'm sorry, at PeopleSoft. Um, and ultimately we ended up moving the, um, the headquarters to the Netherlands. And so my husband and I lived in Amsterdam, right in the center of town for um, two and a half years and got to travel across Europe. I set up operations in Africa, um, spent a lot of time in Asia as well. And my role grew to pretty much have everything um, except the United States in terms of operational support. Um, eventually we came back to the US and I continue to take on different roles um, at PeopleSoft um, and ultimately ending up as the senior VP and corporate controller at a very interesting time because we had acquired a company and right after were approached um, by Oracle in a hostile fashion. It was called a hostile takeover. Yeah. And it was 18 months of something I never wish on anyone. But as I always say, it is in the fire and in the moment where you learn the most. And during that time, I got, again, a lot of visibility with the board, a lot of opportunity to work with um, the senior executives um, and learned, learned a ton. And I think it was finally then when I realized I didn't want to be a lawyer anymore, given some of the things that, that we had going on. Um, we ultimately were acquired and I had planned to, my goal had been to become CFO of PeopleSoft. Um, but since we were, were acquired, that role wasn't necessarily available. So I ended up taking a little time and ultimately landed a role as CFO of Hyperion Solutions, which was a data and analytics company. Um, great 
CEO, first time CFO. And what I loved about that relationship with Godfrey Sullivan is that he was a real mentor to me. And it wasn't only about doing the job. Um, he was very supportive of women in the role. He brought on a chief marketing officer. And I remember him talking to us about wanting to ensure that the environment that he was creating at Hyperion was one that he'd ultimately um, desire his teenage daughters to be a part of. So it was, it was a great opportunity to not only lead in my role as a CFO, but um, we had created a women's organization. And mind you, this was um, kind of in the the mid 2000s or so, um, but there was, a, so there was a lot of focus on women in business and women in technology. And it was wonderful to have a platform and a CEO that was supportive of that. Lo and behold, 18 months later, we got acquired by Oracle Corporation. Uh, and this was just during the time of a lot of roll up of uh, enterprise software. So having the time to contemplate and think about what was next, I would say, um, it was a period of self-reflection. I was about to join a small um, software startup company and I got a call about uh, a life-changing experience for me and that was the chance to be CFO of Gilead Sciences. Now, mind you, when I started with Gilead, which is a, a life sciences biotech company, um, and I personally, not a scientist, didn't know a lot about the company, but did a lot of research about the wonderful work they were doing around the world to support patients with HIV. Um, we were about 6 billion in revenue and maybe 3000 employees. And during my almost 12 years of tenure at um, um, Gilead, we ultimately grew to over 30 billion in revenue and greater than 10,000 employees. and did some remarkable um, things for patients relative to not only improving the lives of patients with HIV, but um, curing um, hepatitis C. Um, I think as of to date, there are millions of people that are cured because of some of the wonderful drugs. Um, we got involved in oncology and, and cell therapy. Um, to look at certain blood cancers. And the company has continued to thrive post leaving. Um, but um, that was a wonderful experience. And uh, from that, it was, for me, it's always about continuous learning. And one of the things that I saw pre-2020 was the um, convergence of technology and life sciences and having a background in both, it seemed like a wonderful time. This was pre-pandemic. Uh, it seemed like a wonderful time to figure out how I can take and meld those skills together and, and work in the boardroom as well as work with smaller companies. So I'm, I sh I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about the global pandemic, but um, while it somewhat changed the direction of that in a lot of ways, um, it accelerated a lot of the trends that I saw. So I'm very excited now to be a board director um, and advisor and work now with more venture pre-IPO firms as well and continue providing financial and uh, leadership. I'm, I'm, I'm a real believer in human capital as well as um, hopefully insights as to how to scale businesses and build great cultures. Well, thank you, Robin. That was a truly remarkable brief, far too brief summary of how your executive career developed. And I saw in that the balance between having very clear plan, but also reacting to opportunities which you don't necessarily anticipate, which come along. And that that gives you signposts to where you might go. And often the path could go one way or another. And then you're very clear about why you chose one path. If you look back at that executive life, what are the most transformational moments where you think, ah, oh, that was a fork in the road and I chose the right or the left, um, I could have done something else, and which have then had a profound impact upon how your career has developed? That's a great question, Sandra, and I like your terminology to call them side posts. Um, and you're right, as, as much as I think, I remember I was a real planner in five years, I'm going to accomplish this or in 10 years, I'm going to accomplish that. But really looking back on it, it was those side 
poster, as you said, those choices yeah. along the way that I didn't know necessarily where they would lead me. I knew I was going to get a different experience. And as I said, um, I just really believe in continuous learning. Um, but more importantly, candidly, I followed my instinct and my gut where I felt the environment um, that I was going to be put in in these situations were one, it was going to be supportive. Um, two, it was going to be challenging or different, and that I thought it would broaden my skill sets. So a, a couple of those critical moments were um, picking tandem computers, you know, after a few years of figuring out, like I said, what I didn't like to do. You know, I, I picked it because it was, I remember reading about it in Fortune magazine as being one of the um, 100 best companies to work for. And I didn't really know what that meant, but I figure it would be a good culture and I could learn. And one of the things about that role is they had what was called a rotation program. And being in finance, it really helped change my mindset from not only sticking with one functional area and growing, but really learning a lot of different things. So while I was in finance, I was in... Um, you know, I worked in, in field finance, I worked in Latin America finance, I worked in corporate. One of the best roles I had, I was taken out of a managerial role and put in as an individual contributor, working with a, a set of um, leaders that were probably two to three levels higher than me. And I remember sulking about it quite a bit and wondering, <laughs> was I being sidetracked, et cetera. But it was yeah. such a good experience because the skill set I learned was learning how to influence without authority. And I think as you grow as a leader, you realize that it's not about your authority, but you're being able to influence and galvanize people and set vision and strategy that gets people to think about things differently is a critical skill to have. So, so that was that role. At, at PeopleSoft, it was really taking that international assignment and getting the opportunity to really globalize my skill set. And I've always been an avid traveler. I told you about boarding school, but I think most importantly, the opportunity to live, we, we were in Europe, but you're living around history and cultures that you know are, are, are old and institutionalized. You learn um, the different values. You get to have conversations with people you know, all around the world and, and getting a chance to experience and live in those different cultures and environments was, was simply amazing personally and professionally. And I think as a global leader, having that opportunity to work outside of the home office and in a different location just really, again, helped hone my leadership schools, my leadership skills in terms of how do you really develop as a global leader and, and understanding cultural nuances and differences, be it in Asia or Europe or wherever the case may be, and how important it is to, to have those understanding. Um, I think the other game changing thing for me was leaving industry. You know, I had an established career in uh, tech here in Silicon Valley. And I remember when I decided to take the um, step as the CFO um, of a biotech company, a lot of recruiters, a lot of mentors said, are you sure you wanna do that? Are you sure you're going to enjoy it? And I can't say I always enjoyed it, but I think it was a pivotal moment for me to step out of my comfort zone um, at, at, at that level as a CFO and step into another industry, going back to, I've always felt the importance of really needing to understand and know the business in order to be successful. And so it was tough. I mean, I had to really, with certain missteps, step back and really learn and understand um, the business model. Um, it was a very different investment model than technology was. Um, I, I rode with reps. I went to scientific conferences. I had to learn how to talk about the science to our investors um, in, in a different way because I wasn't a scientist. But I think it was one of those stretch moments for me that really um, grew my skill set, developed me, and really pushed me. And I, I have a saying of getting, um, 
get comfortable being uncomfortable. <laughs> and I remember those first three years, it was probably the most uncomfortable for me, but also the biggest leap, I think, in terms of my growth um, as, as, a, as a leader and um, as a chief financial officer to be able to apply my skills and backgrounds from another industry and uh, learn an entirely new industry as part of that. And of course, in seeing the marriage between tech, data, life sciences, and health, you were, mm -hmm. you were seeing exactly uh, uh, connections that are so important now um, in the global pandemic, but which also have enormous social benefits as well as commercial opportunities. So I think that that was a very far-sighted uh, view. Sometimes when we make far-sighted views, we don't realize them at the time, but, but nonetheless, that connection of different disciplines, the understanding of the science, the understanding of the tech, seeing how that would play with big data, these are the major forces that we need to understand as, as we go forward in order to create better companies and indeed better societies. You are now, you, another pivot has happened and you now have a portfolio of extraordinarily demanding board membership of major companies. Uh, I've mentioned Alphabet, Salesforce, uh, Honeywell. When you look back to that first opportunity that you decided to take of your first what we would in Britain say non-executive position, board position. How did that come about? Did that come about because people began saying, have you ever thought of? Or did it come about because you thought that's where I'd like to be? Or was it a combination of both or something completely different? You know, it was a combination of both, but I must say um, as the corporate controller at PeopleSoft, um, our CFO sent me to a women's director program, and it was really the intent to really develop me to support the audit committee um, at PeopleSoft, not so much to become a board member, but as part of that learning and, and as part of me taking on that role as the key liaison with the audit chair, I was actually invited to my first board role before I became a CFO by the audit chair at PeopleSoft after the hostile takeover. Um, and I have to say doing that role, I went into it not necessarily fully comprehending all that I was gonna get out of it. I was obviously elated that he had that trust and belief in me, but out of that experience, I got a different perspective of how a CFO should think and how you should interact with your board and your, aud and your audit chair. So when I became the CFO at Hyperion Solutions, I had already been a board member and an audit chair. And it was very instrumental in helping me become a bit more strategic and think about the role um, that the board was expecting the CFO of an organization um, to play. And, you know, succession of board, you can start at different trajectories. You know, I had done some nonprofit, but I think having that board experience. I was on another small um, corporate board, but it was so interesting because we um, had an activist come into the company stock. We had a few um, um, board seats that were allocated to that activist. So we had some other board members join the board. We had to replace the CEO and I would say in that, and ultimately we sold the company, but during that experience, you really learn the role of the board around strategy, around succession planning, um, et cetera. And so those experiences really helped shape for me the fact that I viewed them as a chance to be strategic, the chance not only to leverage my financial skills in the boardroom, um, but be able to just think like a business person. And I, I'm not a big believer in, you know, a, a single function board member. Um, the other thing about boards is you learn the dynamic of a group of individuals coming together four or five times a year and having to provide insights and make decisions and be familiar not only with the company, but with the strategy, with the industry. So they were great opportunities to learn how to pull together information and think very differently than an operational role when you're really indulged day by day. 
Um, so again, I, I always view it as you want to sometimes, you know, think big picture, think high and think long, and then sometimes you need to do deep dive. And so those first experiences, uh, first board roles really helped me start to differentiate and understand how to do that. Yes, certainly what I found is that with every board you sit on, you think you're quite experienced, but there are always circumstances or collections of people where you are suddenly into a new situation and they're the team around you, which is the team of the chair and other board members, and then the relationship with the executives. Um, it takes a different form in different contexts. And in that sense, one is learning all the time, um, however experienced one is, in terms of how you marry the strategy, the culture, and the future uh, trajectory of the company or the organization. And it's a great privilege to be able to do that, but also an enormous responsibility because you do realize you hold, as the board, you do hold the company in your hand. Um, and I think that role that you've had of reflecting between the executive and the non-executive can be extraordinarily um, important. Um, and the relationship between the audit chair and the CFO, the relationship between the um, remuneration and HR chair, however, leadership chair, which I know you hold, and the HR director, these are ones where, where you're very close, but also there is always a distance because of the different yes. relationships that you have. So yeah. I'm very interested to, to hear that you also can take into that your strong emphasis upon the culture and purpose of organizations. And it is in fact to a broader societal question that I'd now like to take our conversation. If I reflect back on 50 years of professional life, it's shocking and shaming for me that sexism and racism are still such features of our lives on both sides of the Atlantic. You've publicly spoken about your personal experiences with racism and with gender discrimination. How can we change this state of affairs? What steps do we need to take? And especially what do we de need to demand of others so that we really can move the dial in a sustained way, so that discrimination and prejudice on the basis of race, gender, class, sexuality, but I particularly want to concentrate on race and gender, what can we do to really move that dial? And it seems to me, as I've said, it's not just about what we can do, but what should we be demanding of others as yeah, well? It's a great question. I mean, if there's nothing that I think 2020 provided us, it's the opportunity to slow down a little to self-reflect. Um, I have an 18 and 21 year old who is senior in high school and a senior in college who were both unfortunately at home way more than they planned to be. And I think about the conversations that my husband and I had with them about what we were say, seeing play out on television you know, during the summer of 2020, uh, not, not only here in the US, but as you said, in a, in a lot of different places. Yeah. And it really, it, it was really interesting, uh, Sandra, because it took me back to some of the conversations. I grew up right outside of Detroit, Michigan in the 60s. Um, and this was also a time of a lot of civil unrest. If you remember in 1968 in, in the US, um, yeah was was a fascinating year for a number of different reasons you know with the loss of martin luther king jr with the uh, assassination of robert f kennedy etc and um you know when you think about that period of time as being a youngster and not fully understanding it but having some of these conversations and then thinking about having some of these same conversations with my children it was sad it was self-reflective to think gee why are we still having some of these conversations? Um, but at the same time, what was really interesting to see this generation really self-reflecting and having an opinion, you know, to see them and, and realizing growing up in a, in a different societal time and just having more awareness and, and candidly um, more, more distrust or more meaningful conversations about how they saw the world differently. And candidly, our role in helping to ensure that happened. 
I think to your other question, what can we do? And you know, I'll I'll, I'll speak first as a, a board member and then as a leader. I, I think there is a role for boards to play. I mean, the reality of it is systemic racism, um, sexism has existed. As you said, I've experienced it. Um, and at the same time, as, as a leader, what can I do to change it? You know, one of the things that was really important to me is I remember the team I inherited in my last CFO role at Gilead, it was all white males. And I, I spent a lot of time developing a diverse team of men, women, different races, sex, gender. That was really important to me. And most important for me was the fact that it wasn't done just to do it. I thought we were a better, more productive team. So I'm a big believer that diversity, um, you know, it is a business imperative. And, and if you're going to continue to serve communities which are changing and, and, and include a lot, a lot greater percentage of underrepresented minorities, I think it's key that you build a culture not of leaders um, at various levels and, and board members that that reflect that. Um, I'm involved in several organizations, but one in particular, Black Corporate Directors, we talk about the consciousness of being a Black Corporate Director and the role that you have to think about people and what is the organization that you're on the board of? How do they think about diversity and inclusion? Um, you think about you know, we call it procurement, but it's supplier diversity. And, and I remember being a CFO is how can I ensure that the people that we procure and do business with are reflective of, you know, diverse groups. I mean, these are actionable steps that we can take. And there's also philanthropy, um, you know, supporting different organizations that support diversive and inclusive societies. And I, I, I think it's important not to let uh, the the moments or the the dialogue, the open dialogue, and candidly, the raw dialogue that all of us have had to have. Um, you say never let a crisis go to waste, but let's let's stick to um, really changing things. And we've talked about that for a long, long time. But uh, again, I think you know until we view it as an imperative, until we get beyond you know, we, we can't find diverse uh, leaders. It, th those, those are just myths. There are tons of um, underrepresented minorities that can be great leaders in corporations, that can be great board members. It is not a question of pipeline. It's a question of opportunity. And at the same time, I'm not a believer in this zero sum game. I think if a company truly embraces diversity, they're going to grow, they're going to do better. And that means that you're going to see more opportunities for everyone. So I, I honestly think we have to roll up our sleeves. It's great to have the conversations, but we need to move from conversations to actions and really be deliberate about um, the role that we as leaders and the ability for us to affect change. Um, and I've seen the statements my boards have made statements. Um, my boards have also put in place metrics and measurements. And, you know, my role as a board member is to ensure that, you know, on the other side of those multi-year goals and along the way, we do make real progress. Um, and I think we all have to call it out. I, I know I've spent um, a lot more time sharing, you know, some of my stories and, and, and some hurtful and some about triumph because I think it's important for people to understand. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer that when you can dialogue with people and, and share so that people understand it's not that, that some of these systemic things that happen, you know, being a black female or, or, or you know, to have a black son are, are things that really happen to all types of people. And, you know, we, we, we have to do better as a society. So um, I, I'm hopeful um, I remember, you know, being in Europe and, um, you know, I would walk in a room and Robin, my name is typically a male name um, yeah. in Europe. Yeah. And it, it would be so interesting because I'd walk in a room to negotiate an agreement 
or work on a lease, you know, we were, were building out facilities and it would be 30 minutes before the person across the table could even figure out how to interact with me <laughs> because I was a black American woman. That wasn't what they expected when I walked in the room. And um, whether you use humor or whether you, you use things to kind of change the direction and really focus on, you know, what do we have in common or what are we here to accomplish? I think that's really important. So. Again, I think dialogue is important, but I also think we all have to be accountable for taking action. And, you know, the, the first thing you have to do is recognize the opportunity that exists. Um, you know, being on the healthcare side um, and, and seeing the, the, the health disparities, the wage disparities, and who they're impacting, um, you know, that, that's not something that can continue if we as a global society are going to all lift, I mean, it, it's important for all of us to see the benefits of adequate health care, adequate wages, adequate education for our children, if we as a society are going to continue to grow. And I certainly believe that that imperative, the business imperative, is absolutely there. I think also it's an instrumental reason, and we mustn't forget the moral case as well, because we have, as women, we know that in wartime, if you take the 1914-18 war in Europe and in Britain, that was a time for great equality of women. Women were needed in the workforce. So there was an imperative to get women into the workforce. Come the end of the war, the return of the men, uh, no, there wasn't such an important thing. And back went the shutters in a way to those opportunities. So whilst I do agree very strongly that there is a business imperative for diversity, which you can see very clearly when you live it and in the data, whilst there is an instrumental reason why we should open opportunities, there's also a profound moral opportunity about humanity and about not allowing unsubstantiated stereotypes to persist. And that I guess I feel for me, gives me a, a moral imperative to speak in a way that I might not have spoken in my younger years, where I might have thought, oh, well, let's just get on a bit and see how we go. Let's let that comment pass. Let's let that um, stereotypical prejudice pass because I want to get better into this dialogue. And I guess I've come stronger to say, no, I'm not going to let those comments pass. Um, and I'm going to confront uh, the clear stereotypical prejudice that one can find on race, on gender, and, and on other matters. Yeah, um, I, I think what you're describing, Sandra, is courage, right? The courage to speak out and call yeah. it out. And you're right. Um, we all have the power to do that. And I, I think that is one of the things I've also grown prof professionally to learn that if you're in the room and you're not going to speak up with, for what's wrong, that that's a problem. And, and I, I think any to your point from a moral or having a conscious, you speak up for what's not right and you speak up for what's not fair. And I think if we all step back and look at where we are in terms of representation, particularly at you know, the more senior levels of some of the greatest corporations you know, in the world, um, and it's not only public companies. I mean, this is in yeah. other aspects of society. I don't, I don't wanna over, beat up public companies, we see it there because we measure it there. Yeah. Um, you know, I've started to spend time in the venture world and the private equity world. It's there as well, right? So you're right. How do we use our voices? But more importantly, how do we raise the consciousness of all to do the right thing? Yeah. And so then you look beyond just the numbers. Oh, well, we've, you know, we've done very well now. We've got three women on the board. We've got four women on the board to look at some of the more systemic matters and also to have the courage to speak. And I guess why I asked about what can others do? Um, it cannot always be women that are talking about gender. That's a very important matter for, for men too. And how um, men, but on the other hand, when one wants the voice of women, it's really important that we have that voice and we don't have men telling us what women think, um, which I'm sure you've had the experience that I've had, 
which is to be in a room where everyone is discussing now, how can we get more women on the board? And you hear a whole load of, of men telling you, telling me what women think. And I've often now moved to say, well, perhaps I could venture a view on this, on what women think, because this is my experience. And so I think there is something about um, those who are in minorities, not having the not taking the majority view all the time and and also as you say getting the voice out and having the courage and the space and all of you and i and others can make sure that other people have the space to tell their story and to make it clear what it's like in their experience it's an enormously important topic absolutely and i think this is where the next stage of what I call inclusiveness comes in. There's diversity and there's yeah. inclusiveness. Yeah. And to your point, Sandra, when we're having the conversation, and I call it just diversity of thought, if you're yeah. inclusive of different ways of thinking, I think you, you end up with better outcomes. And even if you think about bringing folks into organizations or underrepresented minorities, are you creating comfortable spaces for them to flourish. It's yeah. very clear yeah. that I remember, why did I want to become a Supreme Court justice? Because I won a judge for a day in a civic court as a senior, and there was a woman in a black robe yeah. um, that I got to sit side by side. <laughs> and I saw something that I could relate to. And I know for a fact, if people can see people that look like them achieve yeah. and grow, it makes a huge difference, but creating inclusive environments once you join a company is, is equally important. And in, in yes. one of my boards, we're not only looking at hiring metrics, but we're looking at attrition. We're looking yeah. at promotion opportunities. You know, we're looking at, you know, levels that people are brought into. Are we being equitable? Are we being fair? And I think as we start to peel back the onions, we move from, you know, or peel back the onion, I should say. It's like moving to, you know, getting at the under layers of inclusiveness. And I think that's what we need to focus on in society. How do we create an environment, a space where everyone feels comfortable? Because when people feel comfortable, they thrive. Yes, yes. And whilst you can count diversity, you can have all the metrics in the world. And you, it's very important that we have those metrics. But inclusiveness, you cannot dictate, you cannot say you will feel included. The question is, does one feel included? And, and that is about how one can create that space, but you cannot, you cannot determine that someone will be included if they do not feel that they are included. So it's much more subjective, but it's critical yeah. for success. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very, very much. I'm now going to move us on to another contemporary grand challenge uh, in these unprecedented times, as this series talks about, of the global pandemic. And given that a lot of our audience is comprised of Cambridge uh, Judge Business School alumni and students, have you got any advice for our graduating masters and bachelor's classes as we hope that we start, we hope, we must be on the way to emerging and seeing the light at the end of the pandemic tunnel what will life be like? What will business be like? Can you see new trends that young people entering or coming back into a middle career need to really be aware of in these unprecedented times? Well, there are so many things. I, I have such hope. Again, I have uh, slightly younger kids than those at Cambridge, but I have such hope for this generation, just as I've seen, um, you all take here in the US, I've seen the impact of individuals getting out and voting um, yeah. in record numbers, um, getting reinvolved in the political process, um, focusing on supporting and raising, you know, climate issues. One thing that I think all of us have learned from the pandemic, but I think particularly this generation is resiliency and reflectiveness. And I think those are really critical skills. I call it true grit. I mean, 
there is going to be ups and downs. There is going to be unanticipated twists and turns or directions that you hadn't planned on or, or candidly dire situations, you know, as we saw. But if you have resiliency um, and grit, you can overcome them. And I think you're, I know personally, I'm the better for those trials and tribulations, um, even though I didn't necessarily think they were fair. Um, but it has given me the voice, um, the courage, and um, the leadership skills to speak up and know that my voice, um, I, I, I deserve to have a voice to be heard, and then I can make a difference. And I, I think that's something important that everyone should know, that no matter how small, everyone can make a difference. Um, if it's just, just helping your, your colleague, helping your classmate, um, you know, and if you have a broad, broader platform, you can clearly have an impact on a much broader set of individuals, but no one should underestimate their power to make a difference. Yeah, indeed. And I think that if we think about the global pandemic, it's had extraordinary impact because for many businesses and for many people, it's been hugely challenging, anxious, survival has been a matter. And of course, for other businesses, it's given them extraordinary opportunities. And as we begin to emerge from the pandemic, although I think we're going to be living with a different life of restrictions for quite some time, what would you say for us as individuals or communities or companies, how can we take the lessons of this time in order to build a better future um, through our experiences. And this could be, as we've talked, as citizens, as companies, or indeed as countries. How can we take the best that we've learned, perhaps building on your idea of resilience? Yeah, I, I would say, so one of the um, exercises that I got a chance to participate in over um, in, in mid-2020 was the chance to interview different groups of CFOs. And there were um, pre-IPO companies, venture capital PE. There was a set of individuals that were running uh, large multinationals. And then there was a set of technology companies. And as you said, um, you've seen different industries um, be impacted differently due to this pandemic. You've seen great innovation. You've seen people reinvent themselves. And candidly, we will see some industries that will probably never be the same. Um, but in talking to that group of leaders, as well as my experience um, in, in talking to colleagues and in my boards, is I think everyone walks into 2021, and I know we're a few months in, with a different level of empathy and understanding. I mean, you know, through technology, we've had probably much more insights into our colleagues' personal lives and that we're working from our homes. You know, I, I remember a point in time in your life where it was kind of a, a, a Chinese wall where there were certain things that you didn't necessarily talk about or certain yeah. things that yeah. here's my personal life and here's my yeah. professional life. And seeing those merge together, I, you know, one of the CFOs that I was interviewing was talking about, you know, I used to be one that walked the hall to get a pulse. Well, you can't do that, but, you know, through these screens, I'm seeing people in very different places. I've enjoyed so much when we're talking about a serious issue and someone's child or someone's dog is, is right there engaged in the conversation as well. It's, it's created a level of vulnerability that I think back to, you know, diversity and inclusion. You know, I'm a big believer in the 80-20 rule. We have so much overlap and so much commonality. And a lot of times we focus on our differences versus our commonalities. And I, I think um, as you think on the other side of this, I think leaders um, and skill sets of leaders around empathy and understanding are going to make a huge difference. Um, they're going to make a huge different when it, when huge difference when it comes to diversity and inclusion. They're going to make a huge difference in ensuring that innovative ideas meet the needs of everyone. I think they're they're those type of leaders as they think about the communities that they serve. You know, particularly the underserved communities or those with disparities. 
How can we get involved? How can we make a difference? And I think the more that we can reflect on what we've all gone through back to re resiliency and not forget, but held ourselves accountable to our role in reducing some of those disparities um, at all levels within an organization and our communities, I think the better companies we're gonna have, the better communities we're gonna have, which as we all know, are the building blocks for our next generations of leaders. You know, I'm involved in a hospital and the first five years of life, adequate food, adequate education being read to, it makes such a difference in a child's future, right? So the more we can invest in, redu in reducing these disparities in health and education and wealth, I think the better we're all gonna be as a society. Um, so, so I'm optimistic, I'm an optimist in general, but I'm optimistic that while we will never be what we were prior to the global pandemic, I'm optimistic that we will use this as the building plots to be better and that we will hold, hold ourselves accountable as leaders, um, as students, uh, as corporations, um, and as individuals to make a difference and not lose sight of the great suffering that we've gone through, but more importantly, the opportunity to build a better world for everyone. Robin, it has been such an inspiration for me to be able to talk with you. And if it weren't for the constraints of time, I would love this just to continue because there are so many topics of fundamental importance to our companies, to our citizens, and to our audience here in Cambridge Judge Business School community. It's been an inspiration and a delight to be with you. We would love you to come to Cambridge when travel restrictions allow, when we are all much freer, then the idea of hosting you in Cambridge rather than on this thing is extraordinarily um, important to us. And so thank you so much for sharing your views, for sharing your story and for giving us the optimism to know that with resilience, with hard work and with taking a choice and a choice which will in the end play out, uh, we can have a better life. So thank you very, very much indeed for being with us. And thank you very much indeed to everyone who's joined us on this most inspiring and interesting conversation. Thank you. <laughs>